A very warm welcome to the World Economic Forum DWTV debate coming to you this time from Jakarta, Indonesia. We'll be discussing food security. The world has made huge progress in a number of areas over the past few decades, but in one crucial fundamental area, we have failed. We are not able to feed all our people. Almost one billion people suffer from chronic hunger. And if we go the way we are going, things are only going to get worse. By 2050, the population is set to rise to over 9 billion. At the same time, resources are shrinking. So how do we guarantee food security for everyone? I'm joined by a panel which is strongly committed to finding solutions. A warm welcome to all of you. We start with the uh, Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development from Vietnam, Cao Duc Phat. You're an economist trained at Harvard. On my right, we have the Vice Minister for Trade from Indonesia, Sirigar, Mahindra Sirigar. And uh, Mr. Sirigar, you've been playing a very important role discussing this issue at G20 discussions. Then we have Bang Bang Ismawan, who's the founder and chairman of Abina Swadaya Indonesia. You've been working very closely with farmers, especially small farmers, for the last 40 years. And you've also been named as a social entrepreneur by the Schwab Foundation. Yes. Paul Polman is the CEO of Unilever, United Kingdom. Your company has an ambitious agenda for sustainable living. And you're also uh, the co-chair of the World Economic Forum East Asia. And finally, Franz Müller, who's a member of the management board of Metro Group Germany. And you have, you're engaged in numerous projects here in Asia to do with sustainable farming. Thank you very much for joining us on this panel. Now, if I may start with you, Vice Minister Sirigar. Now, what do you see briefly as the demographic challenges facing Asia? And do you think we can really feed our people in the next few decades? Well, as always, one side challenges, the other side opportunities. And the way we look at the demographic structure in Asia also in the same manner. On one hand, of course, we could say it's a challenge that if we fail to provide the food for this increase and growing uh, population, then of course, it's a big challenge. But on the other hand, we could see that the demographic uh, change also provide a fast growing uh, middle income group in Asian economies. And that is a big opportunity for uh, products, for services, and mostly for better quality and more sophisticated uh, consumption that will certainly open up opportunities for investment and more uh, productions. Minister Fat, whose responsibility is it to feed the people? Is it the government? Uh, when uh, it is a responsibility of uh, any government to make sure that enough food available uh, around the year and everywhere over the country and afford affordable to its people. Right. Now, we, let's take a corporate look at this. Uh, Paul, you work for Unilever. Why are you interested in food security? In a world that is already uh, resource yeah. scarce and gets these pressures, uh, we see these pressures showing up in a lot of different areas. Uh, the pressures of climate change, the pressures of hunger, the social unrest. And it's very clear that we cannot be long term on a sustainable way successful if we don't find a sustainable and equitable way to grow in these markets. So it's clear that business as usual is not giving us the answers. Now, uh, Mr. Ismaban, you work very closely with farmers. From their perspective, what is the one key issue we need to ensure food security in the world? First, the farmers need uh, a reasonable price for their, their products in order they can produce uh, uh, next uh, what is uh, harvest. Also, uh, fertilizers and pesticides uh, should be available at the local market with a reasonable price. And uh, farmers used to uh, need uh, 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 cash, so maybe local uh, financial institution can help for that. Right, now we'll come back to the uh, price uh, issue a little later. But Franz, um, Paul just talked about the corporates should be part of the solution. 
you were part of a 20 uh, group company corporate uh, initiative at davos on a new vision for agriculture now what tell us a little bit about what this initiative is and what are you hoping to achieve um, Amrita, you mentioned in your introduction already that there's a disconnect between the population, 9 billion, and the production of food. And the World Economic Forum, in a number of working groups in the last 18 months, uh, worked on a new vision on agriculture, because we all think that the agricultural section can have a very positive influence on solving that problem. We identified more or less three big parts. First of all, the food security. How can you raise productivity and how can you reduce post-harvest losses? The second thing, how do you, can you do this in, an, uh, in a sustainable way, environmentally sustainable way? Think about waste management, water management, and energy. And the third thing, how can you make sure that there is an economic opportunity for the agricultural sector? And like Pak Bambam already said, um, we have to make sure that those farmers have a good living and that they do what they are good at and that they don't get to the cities to find non-employment there because it's very difficult for a farmer. So we have to make sure that the rural sector gets strengthened and that we avoid also social problems. And so we have a lot of very interesting issues which have been raised now, but there's been a lot of discussion about food security this year and sparked largely by the unprecedented historic rise of food prices. 30% year on year from last June to February, which translated to about 10% within Asia, within different countries, of course it was more, but this is the average of 10%. Now, food is a key element in inflation prices. Now, Vice Minister Sirigar, what mechanisms need to be put in place to actually control food inflation? Well, first of all, I think it's important to note that not only food is important, important for uh, inflation uh, management, but food is 60% of the consumption of poor household. So that tells us a lot. And out of that, in Indonesia, 25% of the total consumption of a poor household is for rice. So along that line, I think it's important to look at both sides, the demand side and the supply side. On the, the supply side, I think it's very clear. We need to increase the yield the, by improving the uh, technicalities of uh, uh, agriculture practices. We need to improve uh, the uh, high variety of seeds and then uh, try to uh, innovate and find research for better uh, hybrid uh, seeds and many other instances. And of course, along the supply chain, we need to improve the infrastructure, the irrigation, the rural uh, roads infrastructure. And then on the other side, we need to better connect the uh, supply and the market and the logistical system, as well as more transparency within the market. So it's a whole range of system within uh, the supply chain. But what do you think, France? Is food security a national issue, a regional issue, or is it a global issue? We have in India uh, 12 million farmers, if I recollect properly, and they farm in a very traditional way. Mm -hmm. I think we have to make also that information available to them, what market demand is, if it is a different quality of rice mm -hmm. for the future. Mm -hmm. And of course, as being a trader, uh, I, I think that markets are not only domestic, but also internationally. And if we have excess of products in a certain country, and we have even examples that we waste or we throw away products in one country where it's in a neighbor country needed. Mm -hmm. I think that's, then we talk about trade barriers, then we talk about tariffs, then we talk about customs duty. Mm -hmm. but I think it starts with uh, domestically uh, getting demand and supply properly coordinated and there the private and the public sector have a role. And of course, as a trader, open barriers will also uh, make this easier. Right, so before we actually move to the question of agricultural productivity, now, we did a, a survey on Facebook and asked people uh, what they felt. Had they noticed there had been a price increase? The question we put to them, have you noticed the price of food is going up? And recently, have you noticed the price of food is going up recently? And this is what we, uh, the replies that we got. 89% said yes. 89% said yes. 8% said no. And 3% said maybe. Now, we're talking about a demographic profile, which is quite different from us uh, on the panel and the people maybe in the, in the audience, but it is a major issue 
for people out there that 89% feel that the prices have gone back and gone up and they've noticed that. Now, agricultural productivity would perhaps lie at the heart of trying uh, to sort out and enhance food security. Mr. Ispahan, again, take, talking from the point of view of farmers, what would be the key things that a farmer would uh, require to enhance agricultural productivity? What are the challenges that a farmer faces? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there's uh, the uh, proper uh, make, uh, system in, in agriculture uh, uh, implementation or technique, and I think it is necessary to improve from time to time. Uh, we found out that the uh, uh, system of uh, rice intensification is something that uh, is, is very interesting. Uh, something that uh, not changing the paradigm, but it is just uh, intensify what the farmer has been doing. It's uh, promising in some area when we uh, test it, uh, about 50% of the uh, rice production is increasing. And uh, the problem, uh, as I mentioned, related to the uh, farmer, is whenever the, the price of rice is increasing, I'm just using rice as one of the important uh, uh, food, uh, the farmer do not enjoy the, uh, the, 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 the difference, or, I mean, the, the increasing of prices. That I think the mechanism of uh, trade uh, at the local and maybe international level should be uh, observed. So who should be regulating, the, uh, say, the price of rice? Uh, yes, in Indonesia, there's some, uh, you know, uh, farmers, 60% of the, our farmers in Indonesia uh, own less than uh, 0.5 hectares. They cannot live from that kind of uh, size. So uh, in this particular situation, the, a kind of uh, maybe local or national uh, uh, or land reform is necessary, but uh, for, for a higher uh, uh, potential, uh, the farmer should keep the, the, the the production for their own consumption, mm -hmm. but they have to sell partly for their own uh, uh, what is uh, exp expenditure. But when they buy uh, the, 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 the rice from, from the market, mm -hmm. then the price is so high. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem of the uh, farmers at the local level. Minister Fat, Vietnam is the second largest uh, exporter of rice. How do you deal with this problem? Do you think that there needs to be more investment in agriculture, more investment in small farmers? How do you deal with the issue that uh, Ismaban has brought up? Uh, when, uh, in order to uh, uh, increase productivity in agriculture, uh, well, first we need to have right policy uh, to encourage uh, farmers, uh, businesses uh, to invest in uh, production. And secondly, uh, we need to uh, invest in research and extension, uh, especially in uh, such country like Vietnam, where we have uh, predominantly uh, small farmers. The role of uh, government in research and development is uh, very crucial. And thirdly, uh, we need to have uh, more investment in infrastructure and public services like uh, plant protection, veterinary, and uh, we need also to have a uh, good uh, banking uh, system to support farmers and good marketing system also uh, to assist them. It is one of the statistics that I want to throw before you that of the um, one billion, almost one billion poor in the world, 50% of them are farmers. And when you think of that, that we are looking to farmers to provide us with food security as a key element, and they are victims of hunger and chronic starvation. So there's obviously something drastically wrong at the way we are doing That's things. Right. Now, both of you are running projects in Asia to do exactly the kind of thing the minister is talking about. France, tell us something about, you have a project called uh, From Farm to Fork. How does that operate? We have in Vietnam a project running um, with a lot of different companies, uh, all kinds of seed manufacturers, uh, manuf uh, big, big producers, uh, government as well, in a public-private partnership where we work in five categories of products. 
and we try to develop there a collective solution together to make sure that these problems are solved and that the farmers get money, proper money, for what they do, that we don't have that much inefficiency in the chain, and that they also get a feel for the market price, so they can also see, hey, what can be done, what is in for me, so what is for me the possibility to invest, and to pre-invest in seeds, which is pre-harvest, you don't have the you don't have the money yet of your rice harvest, but you have to invest. I think we have to finance them, and also from our side, more than happy to do so. And Paul, uh, how do you see that? Do you think technology is key in raising agricultural productivity? Well, technology certainly helps, and we have many examples of that. But obviously, um, what you've heard on the previous uh, speakers already is there are many factors that you have to attack simultaneously. And the beauty of this framework of this new vision for agriculture mm -hmm. is that it talks a lot about many of these things, transparency of the market, mm -hmm. uh, investments in R&D, uh, infrastructures that need to exist. Uh, the one word that hasn't come up enough yet is it has to be done sustainably. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that we can uh, get 60, 70 percent production more. Uh, we have about 100,000 smallhold farmers that we work with in the world, and that's hard work. Uh, lots of them on tea, about 35,000. Uh, here the black soybeans in Indonesia, 7 to 10,000, and it's in all countries in the world that we work with them. And uh, the main thing that you hear, and uh, Minister Vat was saying that, and, and Minister Bayo from uh, Indonesia for agriculture was saying it yesterday, uh, the farmer, the first thing they will ask for is, is there a market that is guaranteed, that gives me the opportunity to produce for the long term? So let's start with that one. Anything we can do uh, to create the market and make the market function properly, we have to believe in that before we talk rules, regulations and laws. We like frameworks, but we have to make the market function. So that's really where you have to bring the debate back to. Uh, the good thing is there are many examples where it does function, and the more we make these examples visible, a wonderful example in Vietnam in a very short period of time, which Minister Vat has led to, to actually increase the yield on, and, and sustainably for the whole supply chain, equitably. Uh, we should look more at these examples and try to amplify them fast across the world. Um, Vice Minister Segar, uh, if I can put it provocatively to you, there are some people who believe that food is too important an issue to let governments deal with. Well, I think, uh, first of all, I do think any government uh, has the uh, pretension that uh, it could solve the whole problems. Mm -hmm. But at least for the basic needs, mm -hmm. and especially for uh, the, uh, the poor, that is more responsibility of the government. Now, obviously, in raising uh, agricultural productivity, there's also a pressure on farmers, small farmers, uh, to move in for more commercialized agriculture. Um, is there a risk in that for small farmers? Uh, yes. The, I would say like this. Uh, farmer, a uh, small farmer, they are too expensive if they are operating by individuals. But if they are organizing in a, uh, in a group of uh, consolidated land, mm -hmm. then it is good to uh, uh, another opportunity to, to, to minimize the cost and uh, utilizing uh, a cooperation with the local government and also with uh, local uh, uh, corporation. Now, population pressure also does encourage certain countries to actually try and lease or buy land in other countries. And that's a good way of investing in agriculture. We've seen how China's invested in Cuba and Mexico, several African countries. Now. Critics say this is a form of land grabbing. Well, how do you view this investment in agriculture? I think it's uh, interesting. Two thirds of the land grab, what you would call the land grab, according to the uh, studies from the OECD and the World Bank, is actually for biofuel. And if you uh, see that it happens in some countries like Ethiopia or other places in Africa that cannot feed their people, and others move in for financial interests to then produce biofuel, often with a life cycle assessment that is not uh, fully taking into account all the externalities, you have to ask questions. And what about, uh, Vice Minister Sirigar, about patents? That's another very controversial issue often in Asia. International companies come here, find something patented, and then it becomes unaffordable for local people. Well, again, it's a matter of uh, how we would like to uh, uh, define the collaborations. If it's really uh, for uh, one side uh, benefit at the cost of the others, then of course that in itself is not a sustainable uh, approach uh, in the beginning. So I think 
uh, I hope this type of uh, gathering, as well as the commitment for the uh, new vision of, for agriculture, uh, provide the scope that everybody uh, on board looks at what they can contribute uh, to achieve the common goals, not the other way around, what they could uh, take the most. Now, thank you very much for your very interesting and insightful comments. I would now invite people from the floor if they have any questions to ask. Okay, the gentleman at the back. The small farmers or the poor farmers, I think they do not gain with the price increase because they produce for the captive consumption. And the food prices have gone up because cost of production also has gone up. Right, thank you. So the cost of production goes up for him, yeah. but he doesn't capture the value of the higher price because he's not an exporter. He doesn't sell to anybody else. So I think uh, the areas specific mm. to the poor farmers, mm. I think those need to be even more addressed. I mean, the, Thank uh, the, you. We leave okay. it there, Kaushik. Thank you very much. I think you made a very important point, and with Mr. Isma, uh, Ismawan also managed that, the, in fact, the small farmer doesn't gain from price rise. May I have someone from this side, this lady sitting in the front? Thank you. The population that will actually be growing the products, the crops that we all need, is shrinking, and moreover, we hear that it is also getting older. So what should we be doing as the private sector, the public sector, and civil society to make farming a sustainable way of life, not only environmentally, but socially, so that generation after generation wants to continue to stay on the farm? I, I think the answer to the question is rather simple. Uh, the, uh, how to do this, maybe not, but the answer is simple. We have to make farmer jobs financially so interesting that they prefer to stay as a farmer instead of going to, down, down, to, the, to the cities. Mm -hmm. We see migration to cities, which is socially very difficult, leaving their fam families alone. And most of the farmers do not get very good jobs in the cities because they're not skilled and not trained. So uh, coming back to the original source uh, of the problem, we have to make sure that farmers can make a proper living. Uh, and also uh, to, to the previous speaker, um, we talked about the intermediaries. Uh, with Minister Fat, we had discussed this morning about this for Vietnam. How do we make you know, sure that the farmer knows what the prices are so that he also can put pressure on a middleman which is not paying him the, the fair market price? And we, in Vietnam, we're going to make an experiment. We're going to, produce, to, to, uh, to publish our buying prices as a trader, what we buy from farmers or collectors. We put it on the newspapers or on the handphones of the farmers so that the farmer can see day by day, sometimes twice a day, what the price for tomatoes or for, for agriculture product is. We have to get the information, the market information. We have to get this up so that the farmer can see what he could have made if the, efficient, uh, if the, if the, if the supply chain would be efficient. The gentleman there. Uh, yes, my name is Salim Ali. I'm a professor at the University of Vermont in the U.S. and originally from Pakistan. One of the reasons why Asia was so food secure was because the uh, quality of food consumption was totally different. The rise in uh, animal product consumption has risen tremendously. Uh, what can governments do to create incentives for having more traditional food consumption? And on the developed country side, what can we do to reduce food wastage? Mm. One study uh, noted $43 yeah. billion dollars worth of edible food in the US was thrown away. One fifth of all UK households throw away edible food. With those kinds of numbers, it's embarrassing to talk about food security. Thank you very much. Very important point. In fact, one of the estimates I read, Salim, was that 40% of the food is wasted uh, in the developed world. Mr. Siriga, would you like to answer that? And if any of you, if Paul, yeah, would like... It's not only the developed world. In yeah. fact, in the developing world, 40% of the food is... That is where the number is. The other one is 30%, actually. 40% yeah. of the food doesn't get there. It's rotting on the land. So, again, for reasons of uh, market transparency, they don't know where the demand is. Infrastructure doesn't work. Uh, harvesting techniques, so it's as much at the source. In Africa, 40% of the food, food gets wasted, according to the World Bank report. So that is a big issue. You could feed the world for a long time to come. So part of the, the, the things that we are recommending now is the G20, where we're leading the task force for uh, the business community on how to solve food security, is also looking at waste in the supply chain. And there are obviously many solutions being suggested there, but we have to attack that uh, systematically. On, uh, on the other point, on the changing food habits, which is putting far more of a, a pressure in the supply chain 
uh, are in the demand than, than just the population increase, absolutely. Uh, the other thing that is very uh, much advocated is that we look at nutritional values. I think we can go a long way if we bring the debate not to quantity of food, uh, to, but the quality, the nutritional quality of food. Uh, this is a brochure we made for China, where we train, train 25,000 children in Beijing, what waste at household means and what, what, what kind of consequence this has for in total the total waste in the chain. We also have to educate there on, like you say, on the consumption end. The challenges to ensure food security are immense, but as you heard in this debate, so are the opportunities. What we need and what we heard here today is concerted action at every level of society, the government, the corporate sector, the civil society, but also we need a deep conviction, each one of us here, that the fact that almost a billion people go to bed hungry every night is simply not acceptable at any level. You are watching the DWTV World Economic Forum debate coming to you from Jakarta. It was great to have you with us.